Let's talk a little bit more about cyclic groups. And to that end, we'll introduce a new idea. Uh, so e earlier, we used the pigeonhole principle to prove that if we have a group, any group at all, and any element of that group, then we know that a to some power p gives us the identity element for some p among the natural numbers. So again, remember this is the result of performing the group operation repeatedly with a. And this says that we'll eventually get the identity element, and we use the pigeonhole principle to prove that. Well, since we know that at least one p exists, then we can apply what's called the descent principle. So p is a natural number and the descent principle says that anytime you have a set containing one or more natural numbers there has to be a least element so the set of natural numbers for which a to the p is the identity well that contains at least one element because we know that there is some value p for which that's true that set contains at least one element so there's a least element of that set and we'll designate this p hat and we'll define the order of an element, let G be a group and take anything in that group. The order of that element in G is the least value for which we get the identity. All right, so let's see where this takes us. So let P hat be the order of an element A in G. Now, if you want to think like a mathematician, the question you want to always be asking yourself is, well, what now? If p hat is the order of an element, then I know a to p hat is the identity, and a to the m is not the identity for anything less than p hat. So let's uh, think about that. Well, I might consider the terms in the sequence a, a squared, a cubed, and so on, all the way up to a to the p hat, which is the identity. We know that's true. And uh, we claim that all elements of this sequence are distinct. And a useful proof strategy, if you want to claim something is distinct, if you want to claim that things are equal or not equal, a common thing to do is to try and prove this by contradiction. We claim all these terms are distinct, so let's assume that they're not and that I have two of these terms that are equal to each other. So suppose that the terms are not distinct, which means that I have two powers of a that are equal for some i less than j less than p hat. Here we've taken the liberty of assuming that i is the power of the first and j is the power of the second of these non-distinct terms. Well, by the same argument as before, I can prove that e, the identity element, is equal to a to the power j minus i. Make sure you can prove that. And j minus i has to be less than p hat. However, p hat was the order of our element which means that nothing, no power less than p hat, can give us the identity element. So a to the i can't be equal to a to the j for anything less than p. And so it follows that all terms of our sequence have to be distinct. Well, here's an even quicker result. Let p hat be the order of a in g. Then the sequence forms an abelian subgroup of g. And here's a skeleton of a proof. You should be able to fill in the details. Uh, we have closure. We want to check to make sure that the product of any two of these things is a term of the sequence. And, well, you might say, oh, well, that's kind of obvious because this is just a multiplied by itself some number of times. Uh, however, there's one worry that we have to consider. What happens if m plus n is greater than p hat? Certainly, if I multiply two things and the exponent is less than p hat, it's someplace in here. But if I multiply two things and the exponent is greater than p hat, it's not actually in this sequence. So that's a worry we have to resolve. We want to check to see if there's an inverse. Well, actually, that's pretty easy. If I have a term in the sequence, what do I have to multiply it by to get a to p hat? And finally, we want to establish that it's an abelian subgroup. We want to determine whether we have commutativity. We want to check to see if a to the m times a to the n does give us a to the n times a to the m. And again, the worry we have to be careful about here is that if we are outside of this sequence of terms, what are we going to do in that case? But all of these things are relatively easy to prove, and we should be able to prove relatively easily that this sequence will always be an abelian subgroup of any group that we start with, even if the group itself is not abelian.